sufficiency not only to save us but to sanctify us and to prepare us for glory I pray this morning as we begin to walk through the text of Colossians that you would give us um, hearts that are obedient to your word that we would listen um, to the things that you have to tell us in your still small voice Lord or your screaming banging gong Lord Jesus just be with us as we open your scriptures and lighten our hearts I pray that you would um, send out the words that are from you and that are not from me, that we would hear the things that you want us to hear, and that we would learn the truths that you desire for us to know. Be with us now. In your name I pray. Amen. All right. So when we started last week, what did we do? We recapped once again what um, it looks like to study the Bible and why we study the Bible. So who can give me some good reasons for why we study the Bible. Why do we study it? Yeah, it's part of life. What else? Why do we study the Bible? To know God. And make Him known. Oh, my CC. Okay, yes, to know God and make Him known. Why else do we study the Bible? How can you love someone you don't know? Right? How can you love someone you don't know? How can you look like someone that you don't know? Right? So that's why we study the Bible. And then we laid the groundwork for Colossians. Somebody tell me some facts that we learned last week about Colossians. What are some things we learned about it? Written by Paul. Huh? Written by Paul while he's in prison. It was written by Paul. Yeah, it was written by Paul. Where was it at? Remember? What region? Turkey. Phrygia. That's how maybe it's, I don't really know how to say the name, but it's in the region of Turkey. And it was on a road that um, they moved a lot of goods, right? Anything else that we learned about it last week? Followed another letter that we don't have that we want. Yes, Laodicea. We don't have a letter to Laodicea. What um, kind of epistle was it? Do you remember what kind of an epistle it was? It's a prison epistle. He wrote this along with Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon, right? He wrote them all together. He sent them out with Tychicus to all of the different churches. And they were basically supposed to read them and switch them up. Laodicea had one in there too. So now we're going to take our um, next moments together. And we're going to work through chapter 1, verses 1 through 23. And for the purposes of time, we're going to do our best to work through the greetings quickly um, so that we can kind of camp out a little bit on the person and work of Jesus. Now, uh, I need to tell you right up front that the majority, almost everything that we're going to talk about today is not from me. TJ saved the day because I got the flu this weekend. And I'm also teaching this weekend twice for our women's retreat. So... Um, he sent me a Hail Mary last night and sent me his entire manuscript. So everything that you hear today is basically all of his work. It's all of his research. Obviously, I have put it into the form of the way that I would present material, and I've asked some extra questions. But just know that all of this stuff is um, from TJ, that it is not from me. So think about it. TJ, but no baseball cap. <laughs> Sorry, Hannah, to disappoint you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So today we're going to talk about the sufficiency of Christ. And the first observation I think we can make is, number one, the sufficiency of Jesus for initial justification. The sufficiency of Jesus for initial uh, justification. 
Colossians 1, 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. What are some of the immediate things we can deduce with our CIA from these two verses? Shout out things to me. What can we see from those two verses? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Who wrote it? We already said it. And what is he? An apostle. Who made him an apostle? God, right? He didn't choose it. Who's with him? Who's he writing to? He calls them what? So it's believers, right? This is a letter to everybody. This is a letter to people who are claiming to believe the gospel of Jesus. Not only are they believers, what else does he call them? Faithful brothers. He ain't mad at them. Y'all, this ain't revelation. Like, he's not mad. So this is a good letter. He's going to talk about some hard things, but this is a church that he knows and he sees that is growing. And it's in Colossae. And then he gives them what? A regular, a regular apostolic greeting. He wants grace and peace to be the tone of his message, the kind that only comes from the help of the Holy Spirit through the work of the Father, right? So that sets our stage. And as we move into verses 3 through 8, there are a few things that I want you to keep in mind. Number one, what did we say last week was a big difference in the church of Colossae from the other churches that Paul writes to? Do you remember what the big difference is? He didn't plant it. He didn't plant this church. Epaphras planted this church. So this is a church that he loves, but he actually didn't go there to share the gospel. Epaphras heard the message of the gospel in Ephesus, came back to Colossae, and he planted this church. The second thing I want you to keep in mind, and I need you to keep this in mind as we work through the entire book, is that Epaphras is leading a relatively new church as a relatively new believer, okay? That's a big deal here. He's a newer believer leading a newer church. So imagine, if you will, that even the man who started your church and brought the gospel to your city is likely only a year older than you in the faith. And you've got this new faith, and you want it to grow, but you're constantly surrounded by these other religions and influences. And there are folks who have practiced these other religions, like Judaism, right? We said that was one of the influences that they were talking about, and Gnosticism, that they've been doing for a long time. And they're telling you that all these faiths can coexist together, and it seems odd, but maybe it's plausible. And these other religions have been established for a long time, and they have people within them that are well-spoken, and they're well-learned, and you start going, well, who's Epaphras? What does he know? He doesn't talk like they do, right? And Epaphras, Epaphras can see what is coming, right? He can see what's coming, and he's worried for his congregation. He's worried for the church. He doesn't want them to be taken captive by false teaching, so what does he do? He goes to Paul, right? He goes to Paul. He says, I need advice, I need answers, I need affirmation, I need some authority. Now, I don't know if he went to him physically, I don't know if he wrote him a letter and sent it with somebody, and this is a letter back, but he knows that he needs to head off some false teaching that is creeping into his congregation. So this is what I want you to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the book, right? You have a young congregation that is being led by a relatively young believer, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the context that we are setting up, okay? So, on to verse 3, Colossians 1-3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus... And of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth. The gospel. Keep that in mind. The truth. The gospel. Which has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing. And it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth. 
just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Okay? It's a great reading. Paul, as he often does, he opens his letter with a word of thanksgiving and prayer. As we need to, we need to note this because um, his opening is be, going to become a major point. Paul presents them with both thanksgiving and prayer intentionally. Right? He says, be thankful for what God has done, but continue to press into what God is doing. You have been saved. Thankfulness and you need to continue being saved, pressing on. And I don't know if you can make the connection, but we have talked about this over and over again. Does anybody remember what it's called? When we have been saved, but we're not yet... Yeah, we're, we're being sanctified. Do you remember us talking about the already and the not yet? You are already saved... But you keep pressing on, you are still being saved until the day of glorification. Now, does Jesus need to save them over and over again every day? No. What does it mean to continue being saved? What's the other word that we use for that in our Christian walk? You already said it. Sanctified. They are being sanctified. Thankfulness and pressing on. Does that make sense? We're thankful for what God has done, and we are continuing on the course that he's given us. It's a big part of Paul's writing in this threefold explanation of salvation. A person can say, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I am going to be saved. Let me say that again. You can say, I have been saved. I am being saved, I am being kept, and I am going to be saved. And all three of those things are correct. All three of those are correct. How? Why? Because by justification, we have been saved from the penalty of sin, right? Through justification, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. By sanctification... We are being saved from the power of sin. And by glorification, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Right? Do you want me to say that again? Yes. <laughs> by justification, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. By sanctification, we are being saved from the power of sin. And by glorification... We will be saved from the presence of sin. Okay? Paul, he isn't familiar with the Colossians as he had been with the recipients of some of his other letters, right? Some of his other places that in churches that he sent letters to, he spent a year or two there. He's not as familiar because he didn't start the church and he hadn't visited but he is familiar with them by their reputation, okay? He's familiar by their reputation. In his opening Thanksgiving remarks, Paul identifies three virtues that mark the Colossian Christians. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. Paul says, I have heard of your great faith in Christ, your great love, for others, and your great hope in heaven to come. Praise God, right? Praise God. Here's the things that I've heard of you. Paul uses the triad of faith, hope, and love in other places, most famously in 1 Corinthians 13. And what are those? Those are all markers of every Christian everywhere of all time. So immediately in this greeting, Paul is recognizing that the church at Colossae are believers by the fruit of their works, not just the words of their mouth. Okay? Sisters, what a person thinks of you and your reputation, would it be one where you are known to follow Christ, not just by your words, but your deeds? Would people think of you as a person of faith, trusting in God no matter the outcome? Would people think of you 
as someone who loves other people, not just yourself or even just your immediate family? Would people think of you as hopeful or hopeless in light of the future promise of heaven, right? This that we know because of the Gospels. Is there an area of disbelief or doubt that we need to confess and turn over to the Lord that is keeping you from bearing fruit in those areas? Is there a truth about God that you don't believe that is affecting your relationship with his image bearers? <clears throat> and here's a good one. Is there thanksgiving and praise that you can make because God has grown you in one or more of these areas through sanctification? And you have put off the old way, the unloving way, the faithless way, the hopeless way, and you can see that God is growing you because you are putting these things on. When we come to the scripture each week, we're not just going to beat ourselves down. We're going to say, hey, I'm super thankful. Look, this is how I can see myself growing. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest. I don't naturally love people well. That has been sanctification in my life. That has been God giving me great examples of women of the faith who I just watch love people and love people and love people. And I have grown in that tremendously. And so where can we give thanks for like, yes. Jesus is growing me in this. I can see that I am not who I was, but I'm not yet who I'm going to be. Right? So where can we be thankful, okay? In verses 3 through 5, Paul is reassuring the Colossians that they are true Christians. In the presence of many other ideas and influences and the reality of being young in the faith, these believers needed the reassurance of, hey, you guys are Christians, right? He's not calling them out. He's coming to them in love. And so why are they, in fact, Christians? We go on to the second part of verses 5 through 8. Paul continues then in verse 6 to say that the root of these virtues, faith, hope, and love, is their hearing and understanding of the gospel, you're not going to live out these things if you have not heard and understood the gospel of Jesus, right? Hearing and understanding or believing the truth of the gospel are the prerequisites to walking in Christ or having a relationship with Jesus. We don't do this on our own. So this is why Paul says they can be assured that they are Christians because they've heard and they believed the true gospel. So he gives two assurances right off the bat. Paul tells them, hey, you are Christians, and you have heard the true gospel. Remember that. You are Christians, you have heard the true gospel, because I can see you living it out in your community. And this leads us to our second observation, that the sufficiency of Jesus, um, the support, the sufficiency of Jesus for present sanctification, right? Initial salvation, and then we have the sufficiency of Jesus for present sanctification. Continue in verse 6. Wherever you find these virtues, faith, hope, and love, they are rooted in the gospel. From these seeds, Paul indicates naturally what's going to happen. If I plant fruit... Of faith, if I plant fruit or seeds of faith, hope, and love, what are they going to grow? Fruit, right? There's going to be fruit. If we plant the seeds in our heart through the gospel, there's going to be fruit. And what does he mean by growing fruit and increasing? What do you think he means by growing fruit and increasing? Can somebody tell me what you think it means? Yeah, that's one way. What's another way? How do we... Growing spiritually? Yeah, growing spiritually and increasing. Yeah. Being bearing. Being Say it again. Being sanctified. Yeah, being sanctified. Bearing fruit and increase, increasing is an expression from the Old Testament of growing and multiplying. You aren't who you once were, but you're not yet who you're going to be, right? 
And how do we recognize the authentic gospel amidst all the other ideas and philosophies and messages of this world? The authentic gospel has at times, sorry, the authentic gospel has at all times been known by the fact that it is living. The gospel is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And therefore, it's recognizable by its ability to be constantly bearing fruit and growing. If you have Jesus, you will bear fruit. You will grow. There's not a maybe there, right? There's going to be change. Going back to my earlier questions, where can we praise God for the fruit that we see growing? Where can we repent for the fruit that we're killing? And where can we ask Jesus to feed and water and help us grow? Where can we do those things? Pressing on, Colossians 1, 9 through 14. We've already kind of gone through this a little bit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins we can stop there and have an altar call <laughs> right right that is a great way to encourage a set of believers that are new isn't it this is intercession this is paul's heart for this congregation and his prayer is twofold. Number one, that the Colossians would be filled with knowledge. And number two, they'd be filled with power. We worked through this quickly on the board the other day, didn't we? First, Paul desires for the Colossians, Paul's first desire for the Colossians is that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will and spiritual wisdom and understanding. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom are gifts of God, which he imparts by his spirit to the faithful members of this community. That's how all of scripture recognizes these gifts. And Paul says, now in Christ, they're available to you, right? Sisters, do you realize that if you have taken on Christ as your only hope, that you have been given by the spirit the availability of gaining wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? Right? You have the ability through the help of the Holy Spirit to grow from where you are. You don't have to stay where you are. You aren't who you once were, but you're not yet who you're going to become. And I'm going to say that over and over and over again. Because we're going to change, especially if we obediently seek after the heart of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. You will not stay the same. You will not be able to use the excuse, well, that's just who I am. Because that's not how Jesus works. Believe me, I'm preaching to myself. Okay? That's for me included. And what did we decide in those moments that the overall fruit would be if we're going to grow in these areas. Do you remember what we said we thought the overall goal of verses 9 and 10 were? I don't know if you wrote it down. Maturity. Spiritual maturity, right? So you're going to grow in maturity. You and I can and are growing if we are faithful members of a community of believers. You don't do it by yourself. You don't grow by yourself. You need people. There's a reason. For the church, that's a whole other thing. So in later lessons, we're going to look at how there seems to be some false teaching going around that said certain practices outside of the apostles' teaching might lead to um, one having hidden 
or deeper knowledge, some mystical practices that seem to unlock the mysteries of God. And that is still as relevant today as it was to the church then. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on the Tiki Talkies, but if you even watch one video um, about maybe you do not agree with the way the government runs the world, somehow you eventually slip into the Tiki Talkies of people who are telling you all this hidden knowledge that they seem to have. All this deeper mystical stuff that you can't understand by yourself without them. And that is a false teaching. That is a lie. Right? That is a lie. God has given you everything you need for godliness and for growth through the Holy Spirit. So Paul wants this church to know that in Christ, Christians already have access to the privilege of the full knowledge of God. Paul's saying, don't worry about some special revelation, but remember what is already yours in Christ so you can better discern the will of God and grasp what the will of God demands in daily living. He's giving you what you need to know in order for you to walk uprightly. He's given that to you. He's given it to you through the Holy Spirit. He's given it to you through the Bible. In all of Paul's letters, that's the aim of growing and maturing in the faith, is to do the will of God, right? To please him, to honor him. He's not preaching at us to practice setting our minds on Christ so that we, we might have some sort of out-of-body experience or mountaintop phenomenon. But it's always so that in spite of all the other messages and all the other influences that are out in our ear, we can discern what really is the will of God and how to live it out. In the instruction of Christianity, understanding the will of God is always connected with the command to follow God's will and do it. They're always together. And we need that so bad right now, don't we? It's like we live in the upside down. I don't know if you watch Stranger Things. It's like, I feel like we live in the upside down. We live in a world that is so uh, hostile to biblical living. I don't know if you know that or not, but we live in a very hostile culture to biblical living. And there are lots of people that out of the desire to be loving or out of fear, they're caving in their faith to very unbiblical principles that absolutely stand opposed to the word and the will of God. So how do we know the truth? What can we lean on for strength when all the world is telling you that chasing after a biblically faithful life is wrong? It's the still small voice of the Holy Spirit pressing you on towards wisdom and maturity that we find in God's word. And here's my only caveat on this, but I'm going to, I want to say it, okay? Wisdom is always loving, even if it's a hard truth. Let me say that again. Wisdom is always loving, even if it's a hard truth. And wisdom should always inform how we deliver the truths of knowledge. Wisdom should always inform how we deliver the truths of knowledge. Because wisdom will lead you to proclaim biblical truth that is going to make the world hate you like it hated Jesus. Okay? Let me say that again. Wisdom is going to lead you to proclaim biblical truth that is going to make the world hate you like it hated Jesus. But hear me on this. They should only hate you for the truth and not your tone. Let the hearer understand. <laughs> Moving on. So Paul prays the church would have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding for a reason. And what is that reason? That from this filling up might flow out a few different things. Number one, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Number two, a life fully pleasing to God. Number three, bearing fruit in every good work. And number four, an increase in the knowledge of God. 
Walking worthy of the Lord. Walk, it is a metaphorical expression for a moral or ethical behavior. The obedience Christians practice must be sufficient to give the world an adequate <clears throat> picture of their Lord and his purpose for mankind. What is he? He is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He is showing us how to walk. Walking being fully pleasing to God takes the attention from pleasing ourselves or others. Right? We're taking the attention off of us or other people. We are pleasing the Lord, not man. Bearing fruit in every good work. The harvest of wisdom is works. It doesn't save you, but if God changes you, it's going to change what you do. Right? Special knowledge, like some false teachers presented, usually brings conceit, but the knowledge of God should lead to a love for others. It shouldn't bring conceit, it should bring love for others. He wants them increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul's prayer continues into verse 11 where he prays the Colossians would be strengthened with all power for patience, endurance, and joy. But it is power for all endurance and all patience. Is this feel a little anticlimactic? If God says he's going to give you power, I mean imagine sitting in a home or a gathering place and, and you get this letter, you're with Epaphras, and Epaphras begins to read this letter to you, and it says, the Apostle Paul, who saw Jesus, right, is asking God on your behalf that you would be strengthened. Yes! <laughs> right? With all power. Yes! According to God's glorious might. Amen! <laughs> For the purpose of, da da da, -da endurance. <laughs> Patience and joy. You gonna make a big scene? No. You're gonna walk faithfully for 75 years. And that's not what we expect, is it? This is proclaiming the sufficiency of Christ for present sanctification. This knowledge that Jesus is sufficient to carry us as we run with endurance the race that has been set before us. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And he's not calling us to be power lifters. Even though some of us want to be. <laughs> Myself included. Right? It may seem anticlimactic, yet it is true to the business of living for Christ in the real world. For in this world, the Christian needs all of God's almighty power steadily to continue and persevere despite the suffering, opposition, shocks, and disappointments that must at times be doing this not with despondency or collapsing morale, but with joy. He wants us to do it with joy. He wants 75 years of joy, not happiness. That's different, right? Not that we'll never be happy, but joy looks totally different. On to verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And again, as Paul closes, he emphasizes thanksgiving specifically for salvation, which he images here as a transfer from kingdoms, from the kingdom or domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. This magnificent description of salvation shows the old life as lived under a tyranny where the powers of darkness reign, right? This is where you used to live. Without a divine deliverance, there was no escape. But through Christ, these powers have been forced to yield their prey and see their erstwhile captives released to belong to the realm of a greater king. You have been transferred. You have been ransomed. You have been rescued. And this darkness that you once could not find your way out of, God has moved you 
and he has placed you in the kingdom of his son. Right? He has placed you in the kingdom of light. So now the greetings are over, and Paul is about to launch in and tell us exactly who this Jesus is. Our all-sufficient Christ that leads us to our third observation, number three, the sufficiency of Jesus for a future hope. The sufficiency of Jesus for a future hope. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And we're going to try to do this again. Y'all got your Bibles? I don't, we might run out of time for all of our notes. We might need to just pick them up next week, but we're going to do this because I think this was helpful last week. Was this helpful last week for y'all when we did this? Okay, so we're at least going to try and do 15, 16. Well, it'll just depend on how small I can read. Let's just be honest. All right, let's <laughs> let be honest about that. Okay. Let me do it. All right. Starting in verse 15, what are our first two words? He is. All right. What is he? He is the image of the invisible God. What else is he? Tell me. He's the first born. Are you guys okay if I shorten the notes? Mm -hmm. He's the first born of all creation. For by him all things are created. We're going to come back out here. For by him, so who he is. Hey, can I make an H and not an F? For by him, what happens? All things are created. Where? We come in further. In heaven and on earth. In heaven and on earth. What are they? Are they visible? And invisible. And in visible. Right? For all things are created. Whether, so we come back out here, because these are the things that are created. Thrones or dominions, right? Rulers or authorities. And they were all created for what? They were all created how? During the creation and for Through him and for him. All of this is through him. And it's for him. Can we come back out? He is this and this, right? He's before all things. What does that mean? Does anybody know? Before creation. He's eternal. Mm -hmm. He's before creation. Mm -hmm. And because he's before all things, in him, <clears throat> all things together, right? He is also the head of the church, right? Oh, the head of the body, sorry. Which is the church. What else is he? Beginning. The beginning of who? The church. He's the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. Everything. 
anticipating he might be preeminent. And that's all I have room for. <laughs> for in him, and we can go on. For in him everything he is, he holds everything together. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. So he did all of this. He placed him above all of these things, so that eventually the outcome is what? That he reconciles everyone. Everything. Every person, everything. This is the goal. This is the end result of the image of the invisible God, who God made the firstborn of all creation. And through him he created all things, where in heaven and on earth, what kinds of things, visible and invisible. He, he put him over thrones and dominions, rulers and authorities. He put him before all things so that he holds them together. He's the head of the body, the beginning of the firstborn. So what are some questions that we could ask? Can you give me some questions that you might ask when you look at this? Can I ask something that's just like, I would like yeah. an explanation of? Okay, so <clears throat> when it talks about being the firstborn of the dead, for, or from among the dead or whatever, like I, obviously I know that he's like the, the resurrection means he was the first one, like, well, he, he wasn't the first person to resurrect. No, right? right? We got so, two people before that, Lazarus and Elijah, which right. I'm going to talk about this weekend, also raised someone from the dead. So what does it mean for him to be the firstborn of the dead? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so let's ask that. Where is it at? The very bottom. The very bottom. I had the same question, and I was going to look up Blue Letter Bible last night. Uh-huh. <laughs> but electricity was out from like 4 to oh, 11, no. and I had like 10% batteries, battery, so I'm like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> what so, are the questions that you can ask? ask? <laughs> what does it mean to be the image of the invisible God? Yeah. What does that mean to be the image of the invisible God? How did he create all things? Who remembers Genesis 1? God was there, the Spirit's hovering over the water, and God does what? Speaks. And who does John tell us is the Word? And where was he at the beginning of creation? Was he with God? Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was? With God. And the Word was with? God. Right. Okay? So how how do we... He's the Word. He's the way to create all things. What else might you ask in this? What's considered visible and invisible? Right? Thrones or dominions. What does that mean? Is he over everybody? I mean, this re regular questions. Like, what are regular questions you would ask? He is before all things. What does that mean? Because here it says he's the firstborn of creation. Uh-oh, where are the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons? I can make myself God and get my own world, my own planet. No, that's not what that means. Because he can't be created and before all things. Because, uh, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do it at the same time. So what do we have to find out? If he's not... Created as a firstborn, what does that mean? The firstborn is the what always in the Bible? They are the heir. They're the heir. He is the heir of all things. So that's a really different way to look at it, isn't it? So then when we come down here and we see he's before all things. Okay, now those two things make sense together. It's okay. He is eternal. He is God. He was not created. When we see he's the firstborn, we see he is the heir. And that makes us what? Co-heirs with Christ. These are the kinds of questions that we can come through and ask. Why does he need to be preeminent in all things? Why? So that he can do what? 
reconcile an entire world. Right? He needs to be preeminent so he can reconcile everyone and everything. Well, why does that matter? Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. The question is, you can take three verses and you can sit with this for three weeks. Right? One word at a time. One verse at a time. And understand really hard concepts. The Lord has given us some great resources. Right? And so we can ask all of those questions. What do you think? I feel like I see all your, your wheels are going. What do you think? Did I say something wrong? Yeah, wrong. Okay. Thoughts? I just, my brain doesn't work the way to ask questions. I just accept. <coughs> okay, so this is what God says, and I don't think to question what does this mean? What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think that that is fine, too. Like, my husband is great at that, right? He is not like me. He doesn't ask questions. He's like, Bob said that, so that's what I mean. That's fine. Okay? And that's, and that's good. But we also know that there are people in the world that don't work like that. And so for us to be able to, like, be able, yeah, so it's good. I don't think that that's bad at all. But I do think it is helpful we're going to come and we're going to try to always be prepared to have an answer for the hope that we have. Because there are people in the world that are asking these questions. All right. I have nine minutes left, and I have five pages. Devil speed. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> okay, so real quick, let's talk about this. I want to talk about this because I think this is good to point out. This whole section, um, most scholars today consider that Colossians 1, 15 through 20 is actually a hymn. This is actually a song. This is a hymn that's dating, that dates before the penning of Colossians. It's full of language borrowed from Genesis, Exodus, Psalms, and Proverbs. And far more important, as has often been noted, is the fact that within three decades of the crucifixion, language like this was in normal circulation among the churches to describe Jesus of Nazareth. Listen, I know this is a whole other talk for a whole other day um, with a whole lot of other research, but don't ever let anyone tell you that the church, the Christian church, did not believe in the deity of Jesus until three or four hundred years later. It's an absolute lie. There are plenty of outside resources that you can like just get on Google and find. Where uh, Some examples. Pilney the Younger. Right talks about it. Josephus talks about it. Um, Denny Burke, a guy that is at Southern, he talks about some of the pieces of papyruses that have been found. I think like P46 is what it's called. And it dates to 50-ish AD, within 20 to 25 years. And it's a portion of John calling Jesus God. Don't ever let anyone tell you that all this stuff didn't come till later because it is not true from the beginning. I mean, look at every one of the, apo or the apostles. They were all martyred, right? John's the only one who lived for a long time. Most of them died within just a few years, all believing and all being killed because they believed that Jesus was God. That story never changed. And that is one thing that atheists cannot wrap their mind around. If you go on the Discovery Channel and you watch anything about the life of Jesus, they will tell you that they don't understand how such a large group of people would die for a lie. They don't get it. Because it's not a lie. Okay, it's not a lie. What such testimony shows is that there never was a time from the beginning of the church's life when the highest honors of the Godhead were not given to his name. He has always been Christ supreme in creation, in the church, in new creation. He has always been Christ sufficient in his person, person, God with us, in his work, God for us. But this confession that Christ is the true Lord of all is the essential foundation of all Christian discipleship. And again, we're going to flesh out more false teaching particulars in the coming weeks when Paul addresses them clearly. 
but for context purposes to help us understand what Paul is trying to say here, what we need to keep in mind is that what was happening in Colossae was that the Christians seemed ready to deny the sufficiency of Christ for all their spiritual needs. Not that he wasn't Jesus, not that he didn't die for them, not that he wasn't Christ, but that he, they needed something else. And therefore in practice to deny the supremacy of Christ to which they were already committed. And it's for this reason that Paul drives home the lesson that on the basis alone that Christ is the supreme Lord, he must be a sufficient Savior. He has to be both. So he's the image of the invisible God. This is Genesis 1 language. Let us make man in our own image. Christ is the new Adam. He's the invisible God. The invisible God has actually been manifested to the people through Jesus Christ. Here the creator manifests himself through the man Christ Jesus. Humans are in God's image. He's the firstborn of creation. We already kind of talked about this. Don't shout out your answer, but in your head, think about this. True or false? Jesus is the first and greatest creation of God. Jesus is the first and greatest creation of God. Let me give you some stats on what people think about that. The Ligonier State of Theology Survey in 2022 said almost three out of four, 73% agree with the claim that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. 73% of people who claim to be evangelical. That Jesus is created, not that he is before all things, not that he is eternal. Of those who hold um, evangelically, 75% of them almost believe a 4th century Arian heresy that was condemned at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Think Santa Claus punching Arius in the face. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up because it's one of my favorite stories. So you think Bible study, classes, and learning are those important for discipleship? Yes, because right now, three quarters of people in this country who say they are evangelical, they don't believe in the eternality of Jesus. That's a problem. Right? When we build theology, we build a doctrine, we don't build it upon an isolated text. Isolating firstborn of creation, as the Jehovah Witnesses do here, and building off that isn't fair. We have to take the whole counsel of Scripture, right? Amen. The simplest explanation we can give a firstborn son is always the father's heir, like we said. God's son, Jesus Christ, is the heir of all things. All creation exists for Christ. Psalm 89, 27, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. To be made firstborn by God means to be exalted to the highest place, guys. That's a lot different of a read if we go back to Psalms. He's the creator of all things, the whole created order. He's before all things. Going back to the firstborn creation, he's internal, right? He's eternal. He holds all things together. He's the sustainer of all things. He is the head of the church, supreme over the created order. Christ is now claimed as supreme head of the church. And the term head carries both a functional and a symbolic meaning. In either case, the head it's the source of the decision-making, the authority, the control. Christ is meant to be the source of our faith, and our lives should reflect his commands. He's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. When he's called the firstborn from the dead, the reference is to his resurrection. This means even more, however, than that he became the first to rise from the dead, right? Um, as in one of Paul's discourses in Acts 26, 23, to be followed by an innumerable company of resurrection. This is, like when we see um, him raise someone from the dead, that was prescript, descriptive. That was to show his power. When Elijah raised someone from the dead, that was descriptive. That was to show the power of God. But now when Jesus comes as the first to be resurrected from the dead, the firstborn, this is now prescriptive. Right? This changes. This is all of us getting to join in. Mm -hmm. it, is it because he raised himself from the dead? Yes. And everyone else was raised by someone else? Yes. Okay, so. Everything else under the power of God. He raises himself from the dead. Right? He has power and authority 
over death. He puts death to death, right? He is supreme. He sits above all. He is the possessor of the fullness of God. Okay? It's 1130. I'm going to stop. Because uh, I still have two more pages. Unless you guys have time for me to go on, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to quit. Do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am. To both of those questions, yes and yes. Because is it the power of the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead? Yeah. Because then it says the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, because they're three to one, aren't they? Did he have yes. the power to raise himself? Sometimes yes. it feels like two. Is births. it through the work of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Is it from the power of the Father? Yes. Why? Because they're three to one. Yeah. So when the Father turns his face away. How does that jive with the Trinity? <laughs> just kidding, I want to stop this all. <laughs> like, no, just kidding. That's where I got the two thirds from. I'm just um, joking. I think, but. I think that that, the father, yeah, that idea of the Father turning his face away, obviously he turns his back on Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. he, pour, he doesn't really turn his back. He turns his back the way he doesn't help him. Right? Yeah, right, right. He pours out his full wrath on Jesus on the cross, doesn't he? He's, mm -hmm. he's looking at him. But he's pouring the fullness of his wrath onto Jesus, correct? Yeah. Right. Um, he's turning his faith face away, and he's not helping him on the right. cross. He is receiving the fullness of his um, wrath. So when in, like, I think it's Isaiah, it says, like, it pleased the father to, I don't know the verb. To crush him. Crush the son. Yeah. yeah. Is that just more of the result as opposed to the process? Yeah. That's the result, like, yeah, for him to take on that whole wrath. To reconcile. And I would want to look up the word please mm, and what that means there. Yeah. Um, because in English we yeah. get we it wrong 90% of the time. Like, yeah. and obviously, and as cultures move, pleasing means different things, right? Uh, it does actually, somewhere in here we talk about pleasing. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Yeah, yeah. Like, is, yeah, so I would want to look up what does that word mean that he was pleased to dwell. Um, anything else? And if I said something wrong in that, we'll come back and visit it next week. I was like, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> I have one question. But yeah. I don't know that so when it says in the beginning that like it's all the apostle and Timothy, our brother, are we assuming that Timothy? Writing it with him, or just that he's, he's with him. Hey, he might be writing for him. He might be writing a letter for him because there are a few specific instances where he says, "I, Paul, write this letter with my own hand." So it is assumed that some of the letters were written for him, and he just dictated it. And Timothy might have written that by his hand, but we we're at, at the least assuming that Tim, that Timothy is with him while he is in prison at Rome. He's ministering to him. 
like visiting or like in prison with him? So I think prison works differently sometimes depending on where you were imprisoned. Sometimes you got like a house arrest, um, and he was a Roman citizen. So I don't know what kind of prison that he was in. He like was in prison in a place where he could have somebody there who was helping him and ministering to him, or if he was like in a prison, like the little jail. Um, but yeah, it's assumed that Timothy is with him the, the whole time there. Anything else? I can send you these notes if you want to. It was pretty good, but. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.